नमस्कार जय जिनेन्द्र आई एस जी एस फील्स प्लेजर वेलकम यू आर टू दिस ऑनलाइन लेक्चर ऑन अहिंसा द स्विस लाइफ ऑफ सिविलाइजेशन एंड द थर्ड एल्यूमिनेशन एज अ पार्ट ऑफ ट्वेंटी फाइव हंड्रेड years of bhagwan mahavir nirvan celebration we have our today's distinguished speaker former vice president of city bank and founder of the winsome constants kindness trust sir philip wolen we have today's session chair former chairman of securities and exchange board of india and founder of world largest organization for uh, handicap bhagwan mahavir viklang sahayata samiti padma bhushan shri d r mehta ji we have our chairman and the renowned industrialist philanthropist chairman of force motors limited jai hind industries chairman of the bhandar kar oriental research institute tamar peda trust and many other social and educational institutes we have our president dr sugan chand jain also our founder and the chairman of many academic institutions so i welcome you all we have many distinguished person like professor christopher chapel from lmu dr sulekh ji shri narendra parsan ji manish mehta ji and many others who have joined us from the various part of the group i welcome you all for the auspicious beginning of this session i would like to invite uh, our research associate ms pragya jain to recite navkar mantra pragya ji jai janendra everyone namo arihantanam namo siddhanam namo ayariyanam नमो वज्रायाणम नमो लोए सवसाहुणम एसो पंच नमो यारो सव पाव पणासणो मंगलाणम च सवेसिन पढ़मम होहि मंगलम पढ़मम होहि मंगलम Uh, now i would like to invite our chairman dr abhay navalpal firudia ji for formal welcome and to introduce iscs and other activities Over thank you, you very much uh, a warm welcome to all participants from my side it's a privilege for me to be uh, with you today at this iscs uh, 13th lecture on in the genealogy series uh, we have the great eminent scholar and philanthropist professor philip wolen with us we are all looking forward sir to an enlightening lecture from you i am particularly intrigued at the title you have chosen which is a swiss knife uh, from what i understand a sniff A Swiss knife is not for cutting; it is for solving problems. It's a very small instrument which is capable of doing very big things. And I compliment you on uh, choosing this particular title for your lecture. I think it's very appropriate indeed. It's a great privilege also to have uh, Dr. D. R. Mehta. Uh, to me, he embodies compassion in action. He his uh, work. over the last many decades has no parallel in the world he is a great inspiration and an exemplar of the motivation of the jain society and jain values which we can all uh, take lesson from and hope in our own ways to carry it forward uh, i was told if possible in a couple of minutes to explain the museum project that Uh, amar prerna trust has been working on let me say for the last 10 years of which 8 years have been very intense 
who have been working on building this knowledge center on Jainism. Uh, it is coming up. It is ready. We hope that the soft opening will happen in the coming weeks or so. It is in four parts. There is the metaphysical aspect, which are the building blocks for the values of Jainism. These are complex concepts. An attempt has been made using modern technology to explain these in simple terms. And that has been quite an effort. The second part deals with the evolution of the Jain tradition, Jain society over the last 5,000 years or so, how it evolved, where it spread, who all were great contributors, participants, what the architecture, art, culture of this tradition is, is encapsulated and shown. A third part is about happiness. Jainism, I have always thought, is about happiness. It is not about denying yourself anything. It is about how to attain happiness. And in the present world, whether Jainism has relevance or not is explained in that. And the fourth gallery deals with the Sant tradition of India, the great saints of India, irrespective of the particular um, belief or trend they have been in, they have all espoused the same values. So that is a thing we want people to learn. It is built on a 50-acre site, but the total land I have obtained around it is around 162 acres. Uh, the building itself is 4,000 square feet. Uh, it has a 20-acre landscaped garden, beautiful garden with a lot of big monuments. Eminent scholars and personalities have mentored and supported the content and the display, how it should be. It's been a long effort and we are very grateful to the many, many scholars who have supported this effort for us. We will be having the facility to take 2,000 people per day. So it's aimed to be pretty large. It can take more also, but basically 2,000 is what we would be happy with. The money spent is quite a lot. Around 45 million US dollars are invested in it. It is a unique learn, play, and enjoy center. And uh, for all ages, all levels of education, all nationalities, it is not, I must very emphatically say, a scholarly exposition on the principles of Jainism. That it is not. It is about the evolution of the Jain tradition, the values that evolved from Rishabhdev to Mahavir and for the Shravak, that is the normal Jain person, what is the path between these two great North Stars, if you may call them so. Uh, I hope that we will be op opening in a couple of weeks' time and would like to take this opportunity to mention to you that all of you are most welcome. Do let us know and we will be happy to receive you. With that, let me uh, turn back to Professor Pandey while uh, once again saying I particularly am and I'm sure all of us are looking forward to a wonderful exposition by uh, Dr. Bollin. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now, without any other formalities, I invite today's distinguished speaker, Sir Philip Bolin. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Namaskar, Judge Nendra, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, from me, a confession. I have stolen something from you but it is not a tangible asset. It is more valuable than all the wealth of King Croesus 2,700 years ago. I stole a word, Ahimsa. And 30 years ago, 
I invented a new noun to describe myself, Ahim Sam. And since then, I have used that word every single day in a speech, interview, or article ever since. It has taken over my life. And by the time I'm done today, you will know why. King Leia, late at night on the cliffs, asks the blind Earl of Gloucester, how do you see the world? And the blind man Gloucester replies, I see it feelingly. And shouldn't we all? The Anglo-Indian Nobel laureate, Rudyard Kipling, wrote of young men dying in World War I. And if they ask you why we died, tell them that our fathers lied. That legacy of lies continues today. Everything we think we know about the meat industry is a preposterous lie. Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 See, the world yeah. today is crying out for only two things, leadership and the truth. Today, I'm simply going to tell you the truth. The wise Chinese have a term for it. Can you hear me? Sorry. A big pardon. Yeah, the wise Chinese have a word for it. Zheng Zhao. Listen to the friend who tells you the truth, even when it hurts. So let's just tell the truth fearlessly and forcefully. That is what the Sanskrit word satyagraha means, the truth force. Now, Victor Hugo said there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. But I say there is nothing more destructive than a bad idea whose time has passed. The time for cruelty has passed. Brendan Kennelly in the book of Judas wrote, if you want to serve your age, betray it. But what does that mean to betray your age? It means expose its lies, humiliate its conceits, debunk its arrogance, and condemn them to face harsher truths. Alvin Toffler said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Now, I have long admired Count Moltke, the Prussian general, a soldier who preferred to think rather than to speak, a man silent in seven languages. You see, it takes courage to stand up and speak. It also takes courage to sit down and listen. Now, there was a time when my favorite food was filet mignon and lobster, a fact for which I am so profoundly ashamed today. So what made me as a young man decide to leave the world of lobsters and jets in exchange for shelters and slaughterhouses? To take nothing but pictures, own nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time. You see, something happened to me. I had been to Dante's Inferno, but unlike Dante Alighieri, I did not have Beatrice for my love or Virgil for my guide. I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the many cancers that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before. In the slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother wail as a harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. And I discovered that when we suffer, we suffer as equals. And in their capacity to suffer, a dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. So briefly, this is where I work today and have for the last 30 years. Wow. In China, 7,000 magnificent moon bears, their limbs torn off in traps, are imprisoned in steel coffins welded shut as catheters drain bile into a bucket which the Chinese drink. The bears go insane. In Korea, dogs are beaten to death in the marketplace because the butchers believe that pain and suffering makes the meat tasty. In South Africa, 5,000 captive lions are drugged and killed with guns, spears, or hunting dogs, and they call it sport. In Canada, 300,000 baby seal pups were clubbed and skinned alive on the ice 
their tiny hearts still beating. And in my country, Australia, we killed 90 million docile kangaroos who adorn our coat of arms, the largest land animal slaughter on the planet. And we sent billions of our animals born on Australian soil on death ships to the Middle East, where their eyes are stabbed out and their tendons are slashed. Every penny I invested in the Basatine slaughterhouse in Cairo to alleviate suffering was utterly wasted. In Asia, dogs are suspended on hooks and skinned alive to make trim and fur coats sold in the West. Dolphins and whales are stabbed to death in the shallows of Japan and the Faroe Islands. Huge bays are blood red. 100 million sharks are torn from the sea, their fins hacked off and their bodies thrown overboard to die agonizing deaths or shark fin soup. Remember, sharks were here before there were trees, before the dinosaurs. Sharks survived five mass extinctions and we will wipe them out in one generation. And factory farms spew chemicals into the ocean, creating hypoxic dead zones of one million square kilometers, killing coral, plants, and ocean animals. And so-called unviable dairy calves who cannot be sold for veal, are killed by farmers smashing in their skulls and jumping on their ribcage and crushing their hearts. And billions of bouncy little chicks are ground up alive in mechanical mincers simply because they are male. Now they say you always remember your first love, but not for me. But I do remember my first hate, and that was the hatred of animal cruelty. You see, cruelty is not a bug in the system. It is a feature of the system. The system cannot be repaired. It can only be replaced. So today, I support some 500 projects in over 40 countries, 55 of which are in India. And I have been to some very sad places. Dachau in Germany, Kurigado in the Philippines, Gallipoli in, in Turkey, Jalimalabad in India, Punta Kinte Island in the Gambia, the tunnels of Kuchi in Vietnam, Gundichmara in Portland, Australia, Sharpville and Soweto in South Africa. At Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, in a dark hushed room, I trembled as a million tiny candles flickered, each representing an innocent child killed in the Holocaust. And I've witnessed horrors inflicted by humans on powerless animals in slaughterhouses, factory farms, and laboratories. And that is why I wake up at night screaming with nightmares. The astrophysicist Carl Sagan's photograph of the Voyager spacecraft shows planet Earth, an insignificant speck, a microscopic dot in space lost in the cloud of galaxies. And he described it as our beautiful home, our pale blue dot suspended on a sunbeam. What an arresting, captivating, enchanting thought. Our pale blue dot, our home suspended on a sunbeam. Well, today our pale blue dot, our beautiful home Humans comprise 30% of the biomass of land animals. Animals in slaughterhouses account for 66%, and wild animals living freely are decimated down to 4%. 4%. 70% of all the birds, descendants of the dinosaurs, are in cages awaiting slaughter at the bloodstained hands of cruel humans. We humans have turned Carl Sagan's beautiful blue planet Earth into blood-stained planet slaughterhouse. You see, one billion people today are hungry. 20 million people will die this year from malnutrition. Cutting meat by only 10% will feed 100 million people and eliminating meat will end malnutrition forever. And food prices are skyrocketing. Thai rice used to cost me for my projects in Southeast Asia, 197 US dollars a ton. 
and then went up to 1,015, a five-fold increase in five months. And poor countries sell their grain to the West for hard currency, whilst their own children starve in their arms, and the West feeds it to livestock. So we can eat a steak. I bet I'm not the only person here today who sees this as a crime. Believe me, every morsel of meat we eat is slapping the tear-stained face of a hungry child. When I look into her eyes, do I remain silent? If everyone ate a Western diet, we would need at least two planet Earths to feed us. We've only got one and she is dying. The Earth can produce enough food for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. Now in human history, only 100 billion human beings ever lived. Eight billion people are alive today. And we torture and kill two billion sentient living, loving animals every week. We stab and suffocate one billion ocean animals every eight hours. If we were killed at the same rate, we'd be wiped out in one weekend. Trillions of fish are ground up into pellets to feed to livestock. Vegetarian cows are now the world's largest ocean predators. The oceans are dying in our time. By the next generation, all our fisheries will be dead. The lungs and the arteries of the earth and oceans sequester more CO2 than all the forests of the world put together. Every second breath of oxygen we inhale is produced in the ocean. But we use the ocean as a private pantry and as a public toilet. The Pacific gyra now is so full of plastic, junk and human feces, it has created a floating footprint bigger than India. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one species. And we now face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism did this, a biologist would call it a virus. It is a crime of unimaginable proportions. So that is why I say Ahimsa is the Swiss army knife of a civilized and sustainable future. One instrument solves our ethical, economic, environmental, water and health problems and ends animal cruelty forever. After, him, after the himsa, in my opinion, everything else is just commentary. Upon this, civilization will be built. My other thought is this. The first great illumination for the human civilization was by Galileo and Copernicus. They told us where we lived in the heliocentric solar system. They told us where we lived. So it was basically about real estate. Location, location, location. The second great illumination was by Charles Darwin. He showed us where we came from, all of us. We all came from the same family. He told us where we came from. But my theory, and I'll tell it to you today, is this. There is a third illumination and it is the greatest of them all. And that is Ahimsa. It shows us how we should live. Without knowing how we should live, it does not matter where we live or how we got here. Ahimsa gives us the right to be here in the first place. Ahimsa is our friend, our future, and it is the only future worth having. Without Ahimsa, our lives will be, in the words of Thomas Hobbes, solitary, short, poor, nasty, and brutish. And when I think about a world without Ahimsa, I weep at the words of the poet John Whittier. Of all the words of tongue and pen, the saddest are 
it might have been. And I say that Ahimsa also gives us the peace dividend. I addressed the World Parliament of Religions and I said, the peace map is drawn on a menu. Peace is not just the absence of war. It is the presence of justice. Justice must be blind to race, color, religion, and to species. If it is not blind, it will be used as a weapon of terror. And there is unimaginable terror in those ghastly gulags we call slaughterhouses, factory farms, and vivisection laboratories. Whereas Lord Acton said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So talking about peace while still killing animals is like loving literature and still burning books. They are mutually exclusive ideas. They are incompatible in the same way that science is incompatible with the Flat Earth Society. Now, I have visited cathedrals, temples, mosques, gurdwaras, shrines all around the world. And these edifices are a source of great spiritual nourishment on every days and holy days, in moments of joy and in sorrow and fearful times of war, pandemics, flood, fire, drought, and doubt. That is the special quality of all sacred sites. All sacred sites. So what kind of person would dare to do any of the following? Who would smash the black stone in the Kaaba and the Grand Mosque in Mecca? the most revered site in Islam, or chip souvenirs of the Binakshi temple sculptures in Madurai, dedicated by the Hindus to Lord Shiva, or have a barbecue at the Mani Lakshmi Tirth, so beloved by the Jains, or urinate on the Western Wall in the old city of Jerusalem, revered by Jews, or graffiti the ceiling of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, beloved by Catholics, or defecate at Angkor Wat in Cambodia, so beloved and revered by the Buddhists. Or drink alcohol at the Golden Temple in Amritsar, the most sacred site of the Sikhs. Or spray obscenities on the pillars of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, where Anglicans celebrate Christmas and Easter. Or jet ski through the Tory gates of the Itsukushima Shrine in Japan, sacred to Shintoism or dump rubbish in the Lotus Temple in Delhi, so loved by the Baha'i faith. And for secular people, who would want to vandalize Stonehenge, the pyramids, the statue of David in Florence, the Mona Lisa in Paris, Picasso's Guernica in Madrid, the Taj Mahal in Agra, or Zedwan's Spring Festival on the river in China? No decent human being will even contemplate committing such a foul atrocity. But the same human beings have no hesitation in vandalizing and trashing the greatest cathedrals, temples, and wonders of the natural world every day. Our oceans, our rivers and lakes, our mountains, valleys, and rainforests, our air, aquifers, and glaciers. The consequences of this barbarism will be dire, indiscriminate, and terminal. And as usual, the innocent, the powerless, will suffer first and the most. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the Manhattan Project, watched the Trinity nuclear test in horror, and he quoted the Bhagavad Gita. Now I become death, destroyer of worlds. And he wrote, the physicists have known sin, and this is a knowledge they cannot lose. They knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed, a few people cried, most people were silent. Our lifestyles are building our own Manhattan Project, wreaking more destruction than the atomic bomb every year. 
these acts could never be done by Anna himself. Never. Now, there are two peak predators on this planet, humans on land and orcas in the ocean. In the 20th century, human beings killed 200 million members of their own species. Orcas killed none. And don't expect any protection from your own governments either. In the 20th century, 100 million people have been killed by their own governments. So why do I speak so frequently to a small community like yours? So frequently. The anthropologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a few committed people can change the world. Indeed, that is the only thing that ever has. Well, there are only 13 million Jews in the world, but they play such a vital role in international affairs. Look at the number of Nobel Prizes they win every year. My wife Trix and I sat in the stadium at the Olympic Games, full of pride, as Australia, with a population smaller than Florida, won more medals than every country in the world, except for the US, China, and Russia. Tibet's population is only 3 million. Ukraine is 40 million. There are 12 million Uyghurs, 6 million Syrian refugees, 1 million Rohingyas. Is there anyone who hasn't heard of the plight of the Ukrainians, the Tibetans, the Uyghurs, the Syrians, or the Rohingya? No. But there are over 600 million vegetarians and vegans in the world. That is bigger than the United States, England, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Canada, Australia, all put together. If we were one nation, we would be bigger than the 27 nations of the European Union. We are bigger than NATO. We are bigger than OPEC. We are bigger than the 11 member nations of ASEAN. We are bigger than the 29 nations of Latin America and the Caribbean combined. We are bigger than WANA, the 25 nations of West Asia and North Africa combined. We are bigger than the population of the 22 Arab nations combined. We are bigger than the old Warsaw Pact countries, including the old Soviet Union combined. If we were one religion, we would be bigger than every religion in the world, excluding three largest ones combined. And despite this massive, powerful demographic footprint, we are still drowned out by the raucous hunt and shoot and kill and cartels who believe that violence is the answer when it should not even be a question. But we live in a world of sound bites and tweets. It reminds me of Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she coins the term, the banality of evil. This is how a deceitful journalist at the Australian of the Year Awards twisted my innocent words. Mr. Waller, I'm surprised a man of your standings would say that meat is murder. A little old lady with a budgerigar is offending God. Livestock production is unethical. There will be no peace until we stop killing animals. In industry is unattractive and animals are like human children. Can't you see how offensive this is to our rural farming audience? Well, this was my diplomatic counterpunch. If you're gonna quote me, please do it honestly. I did say, a robin red breast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. But that came from William Blake, the poet in Auguries of Innocence. And it was the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who said, a sparrow does not fall from the sky without Allah knowing. And yes, I did say, the commandment thou shalt not kill, applies to the murder of any living being. It was inscribed on the human breast long before it was proclaimed from Mount Sinai. As long as there are slaughterhouses, there will be battlefields. But that was me, that was Leo Tolstoy. And yes, I did say the roots of cruelty are not strong, just widespread. But a time will come when inhumanity, protected by custom, will succumb to humanity championed by thought. A man is ethical only when all life is sacred to him. But actually, 
That was Albert Schweitzer, winner of the Nobel Prize. And yes, I did say, as long as we kill animals, there will never be peace. It is only a step to the concentration camps of Hitler and Stalin. There will be no justice as long as man stands with a knife and destroys those who are weaker than him. But that was actually Isaac Singer, also a Nobel Prize winner. And yes, I admit I did have something to say about animals and children. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard with the young goat, the young lion with the young ones of the herd, and a little child will lead them. But that came from the prophet Isaiah. And no, I didn't say a word about greed and ambition. That wasn't me. That was Jesus. Blame him. He's the culprit. Behold the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. King Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed as one of these. And for good measure, he threw in a left hook and an uppercut. Whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So are you as a journalist suggesting that your conservative rural audience is offended by Nobel Prize winners and the prophets? Or should I just go home and burn my books? I seem to recall that was the strategy favored by Paul Pot. Well, the journalist was speechless and he attacked me for being a radical. We need another radical Copernicus or Galileo to remind us that we are not the center of the universe. Animals are not just other species, they are other nations and we murder them at our own peril. We are not prisoners of our past. We have a history of discarding outdated traditions. Sati, child marriage, child labor, slavery, witch trials, apartheid, and lobotomies. Now, I speak to audiences in many countries, and they're all good, caring, decent, loving people, who genuinely want to change the world, as long as they don't have to change themselves. But life doesn't work that way. First we change in our hearts, and then the world follows. So I explain it gently. I say, the most beautiful word ever written at any time, in any language, in any country, in human history came from India, ahimsa, non-violence to any living being. And it is beautiful, not because it describes our nationality, our politics, our religion, our diet, or our lifestyle, but because it describes our character. It says we oppose violence wherever it occurs. And for convenience today, I use the term Ahimsa interchangeably with Jain, even though there are millions of people who practice the Ahimsa principle who are not Jain. Indeed, I say that the Jain community is a welcome soulmate and traveling companion in the rapidly growing vegan movement all around the world. Now, Christopher Hitchens was an outspoken atheist, an intellectual, and the author of God is Not Great. Now, in the, in the wake of 9-11, Dennis Prager, an American religious broadcaster, demanded Hitchens' answer to a binary yes or no question. He asked Hitchens, imagine you are alone on a street late at night in a foreign country and you're approached by a large group of young men, would you feel more safe or less safe knowing that they had just left a prayer meeting hearing a sermon delivered by a religious leader? Hitchens replied, well, just to stay with the letter B, I have had that experience. In Belfast, Beirut, Bombay, Belgrade, Bethlehem, and Baghdad. Absolutely. I would feel threatened if the men who approached me in the dark had just attended a religious meeting. He then described the violence of religious fundamentalists of every stripe. 
and his evidence was indisputable. He had every right to be terrified. Now, like Hitchens, I too have traveled widely. I imagine myself as an Australian Christian walking alone down a dark, deserted street late at night in these foreign lands. And I inadvertently stumbled into a large group of men who had just attended a, a prayer meeting and a sermon by a religious leader. Yes, I too would be terrified. Unless, of course, these young men in the dark street happen to be James. Frankly, the more fundamentalist these Janes were, the safer I would feel. <laughs> I, would have, I would have no difficulty dealing with a mob of young Janes imposing ahimsa on me. Rather than being beaten, I would be greeted with a smile, a joke about the Australian cricket, and if I'm lucky, I might get invited to dinner at their homes. Hitchens hated dogma, but he could be very dogmatic. So I see it this way. Ahimsa is not a religion. It's just an old idea whose time has come. The Ahimsa is by definition a proto first responder. They don't run into burning skyscrapers to rescue bomb victims. They create a world where such an atrocity would be unthinkable. And societies react to geopolitical acts of violence after they have occurred. But the Ahimsan mind is different. It is anticipatory. Peacefully spreading a message of nonviolence in a cruel, unsustainable, an intolerant world dominated by brutal leaders like Russia's Putin, America's Trump, China's Xi Jinping, North Korea's Kim Jong-un, Turkey's Erdogan, Egypt's El-Sisi, Poland's Kaczynski, and Myanmar's generals. And sectarian violence will define the misery of the 21st century. Israel, Pakistan, Syria, the US, Myanmar, Ukraine, Turkey, Russia, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines, Nigeria, and Somalia. So this is my idea and I've devoted my life to it. And I put myself in harm's way to defend it. An ethical, peaceful, and sustainable future for humankind is possible, but only if it is Ahimsan. The Ahimsan diet alone protects our health, our environment, our water resources, and our economies. It wards off a variety of cancers, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and a range of zoonotic diseases which spread from animals to humans. Imagine the health disasters we could avoid it by simply living an Ahimsan life. E. coli and salmonella, HIV from chimpanzees, mad cow disease, avian flu, Ebola from bats, COVID from pangolins, swine flu, SARS and rabies. And the Center for Disease Control now says that over 70% of all diseases that we have are caused by interferences with animals. My speech, Get Animals Off the Menu, received tens of millions of views and was independently translated into over 20 languages. And Oxford University calculated that if it was adopted, it would save $30 trillion a year in health and environmental costs alone. And antibiotics pumped into farm animals cause resistance in humans, killing 10 million people per annum, costing the global economy $100 trillion a year. This is 60 times what the whole world spends on aircraft carriers, missiles, bombs, bullets, destroyers, tanks, planes, guns, and spies. And our human predisposition to violence is ubiquitous. There is a mass shooting every single day of the year in the United States where there are more guns than people. And nonviolence to any living being also includes nonviolence to oneself. 
the propensity for self-harm and suicide, particularly in the West and among young people, would be unthinkable to anyone with an Ahimsa mind. And Ahimsa is not limited to physical violence alone. It includes our thoughts and our words as well. I am not a Jain, a Buddhist, or a Hindu. But I can say with confidence, Ahimsa is the perfect paradigm for efficient resource allocation, the highest and best use of five finite resources, air, land, water, time, and capital. It massively reduces our crippling health budget deficits, deforestation, greenhouse gas emissions, hypoxic dead zones, and it ends animal cruelty forever. I like thought experiments. So here's one. The Jewish Talmud says, to save a single life is to save the whole world. Indeed, the man who leaps into a river to save a kitten is a hero. So imagine my dream experiment, a new corporate entity called the Ahimsan Movement. And imagine only one in 10 humans, one 10% 10 of humans followed the Ahimsan dream. I've calculated that this decision alone would save the lives of two million sentient living beings over the lifetime of a single child born in the West today. Two trillion lives saved. This is not a trivial number. That does not only save the whole world, it gives us the right to share it. And I go further. What value would a rational civilized world place on the Ahimsa movement that you promote? plus all the added environmental, ethical, and health benefits it provides. Name one religion, one organization, or one individual who would not want to be a member of the Ahimsan family. The impact would be incalculable. The Ahimsan movement would be a worthy recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. After all, Many institutions have already won this honor. Some you've heard of and some you probably haven't. Amnesty, Red Cross, the Quakers, the Institute of International Law, the Campaign to Ban Landmines, the International Labor Organization, Nansen for Refugees, and the Campaign for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. I want the Ahimsa ethos to ignite a fire in the hearts of every human being on the planet because it is a priceless gift. It's a precious gift, so priceless. It is a key to locked doors of secret rooms in your own castle. That is Ahimsa. Ahimsa rearranges, rearranges completely the furniture of your mind. Abraham Lincoln's address to Congress before signing the Emancipation Proclamation Against Slavery reads, we shall nobly save the, less, the last best hope of earth. It is plain, peaceful, generous, and just. If it is followed, the world will forever applaud and God must forever bliss. So Ahimsa resonates deeply in me because it is our last and best hope. Without it, this may well be our final century. Now, as Sulek and Marish know, I have championed Ahimsa in thousands of articles and speeches in the European Parliament in Brussels, the Parliament in The Hague, the Israeli Knesset Parliament in Jerusalem, the Jena Convention in California, the Parliament of World Religions in Melbourne, and universities on every continent. And I'm happy to say I'm actually getting traction in universities, in companies, in congresses, in medias, and in religious institutions too, many of which 
I don't have any involvement because we are seeking a new kind of jurisprudence, a new legal system, a foro consciente, a court of the conscience. Now, Judge White's closing words in the bonfire of the vanity were these. The law is humanity's attempt at decency. <clears throat> so let us join the battle in a war that decency cannot afford to lose. Because in the end, only three things matter. How deeply you love, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things that were not meant for you. Cruelty was not meant for you. Often asked, Philip, do you have hope? 2,700 years ago, Hesiod, the Greek poet, described the cursed gift the god Zeus gave Pandora. You've heard of Pandora's box. And despite the spite warnings, with her girlish curiosity, Pandora opened the box, releasing all the curses that plague mankind. Sorrow, disease, violence, greed, and madness. And she relents in terror. She is mortified. So she opens the jar again, releasing the last element still in the jar and lets it fly out. It was hope. Albert Hamu wrote in Return to Tepasa, in the depths of winter, I learned that within me lay an invincible summer. So yes, I do have hope because of you. Our hymn sons are on the right side of history. Force multipliers with massive traction to change the world in a single generation, creating a new enlightenment the second renaissance. Thought leaders in the greatest social justice idea since the dawn of writing, 6,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. A revolutionary idea, more powerful than the Industrial Revolution, the Reformation, the Hubble Telescope, or anything ever conceived by Galileo, Copernicus, Einstein, Darwin, or Freud because it protects the most precious of all things, life. So when history is written and animal cruelty is consigned to the garbage dump of infamy, the Ahimsa's fingerprints will be on every page and civilization will owe them a debt of gratitude it could never repay. I can't wait for that beautiful day to dawn. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your beautiful, uh, excellent, and inspirational talk on Hinsa. So today you gave us a new word, a new concept of Hinsa. Though uh, I uh, was introduced with this word, through your long email conversation with Suvenji and Sudeji, where I was in blue. So thank you so much. Uh, before I invite today's chairperson for his remark, I would like to invite questions and queries if anybody is having their mind. So friend session is open for uh, questions and queries. If Sir, please unmute Suganji. Shugan, unmute. Unmute, Shugan. Yes, I did. Yeah. No, now uh, you are. Yes. Let us have one question and then we proceed further. Okay. Anyone? Pilar, you want to have some question or anybody? No, I'm just. I'm absorbing this beautiful talk. Okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Sulek Ji. <laughs> yeah, Tushita, Bye, Sulek, bye. Let us, yes, Tushita, let us give her a chance. 
Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good Kushida, morning. Yeah. Yeah. Jai Janendra, everyone. Uh, my name is Yash, and uh, I wanted to ask this. Uh, first of all, I think uh, thank you, Professor Philip. I I mean that was very insightful. Uh, the only question that I have, like, uh, to want to ask is like. Uh, because we talked about religion, we talked about you know ahimsa, and I, you are you, when you said ahimsa is an old concept whose time has come, uh, but you know sometimes we have these concepts of just wars in different religious you know traditions, like something bad is happening and they justify it based on the doctrines, based on the history. How do we navigate such things in the present time? Because these are very then they justify you know the justification comes from certain doctrines themselves. So can you, what would you like to say to those, you know, approach? Yeah. Yes, that's a very good question. It's a question for the ages. Um, one of the things I try to do is I meet people where they are. If they come with a very strict religious dogma and quote sections of their own holy books, I say to them, I bet you're a knowledgeable person and you could cite with equal veracity wonderful things that come out of your book that supports my contention. And it's the, invariably, they say, yes, in fact, we, we, we can do that as well. We only want to have a debate. That's the question, particularly on the question of meat eating. We're making such big inroads in places where meat eating was endemic, even Australia, in Israel. Um, it is, we've, we've got people in Bangladesh becoming vegan. There, there's no one size fits all, but I, I always stay away from the dogma because some of these things are inbred. I'll tell you why, not, not bred, it's inculcated from an early age. Um, and I was sitting in, in, in California some years ago, and I met all these young Jane people in their 20s and 30s, immaculately dressed, very intelligent, highly educated people. And I had to ask them, what well, I think is a kind of silly question. I asked them, when was the first time you ever heard the word ahimsa? And not one of them could tell me. They, they just don't remember when they heard it first. And I think it just came as part of, maybe it's like in the mother's milk. They grew up with it. And I took, told them like, by, you know, you guys, you, you Jains, you get it easy. You know, you're born understanding Ahimsa. I had to wait till I was a doddering old fool to understand it. So you guys are exceptionally lucky. Don't waste it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now uh, I invite today's chairperson, uh, Padma Bhusar, Sri D.R. Mehtaji. How what much, do you, sir? How much time I have? And how many minutes? Sir, uh, 10 to 15 minutes you have. Thank you. And distinguished participants. We just had powerful plea made by Ms. Mr. Kulan against killing. I will confine my comments relating to animals, not about parts. Uh, I remember having heard Mr. Kulan long time ago saw his speech on a video, so powerful, so overwhelming. And I find it's a privilege to see him personally the people of his kind, so committed, so sacrificing, to meet them even on the Zoom, the great thing. Killing of animals, God, Helpless, helpless, chained. It's beyond comprehension. At least as Jane, I find it difficult. 
Das war das mein Liedchen. Mit Blechern. Selbst Hollanders. Mies or Mary Slotling. Becoming more and more commercialized. And becoming totally bereft of domestics. Kind of cruelty they inflict is mind boggling. Homo sapiens dominate and dictate the world. But despite being human, the strategy is that we are not humane. Species, I mean, the word coined by Professor Peter Singer, is one of the greatest biotheists in the world. In fact, we published two of his books in Hindi. Needs to be dealt with. Now, this kind of killing is also affecting the environment. Today, the world becoming more and more conscious or protection of environment. Hopefully with this awareness, perhaps in my mind, this is one ray of hope that killing might be controlled. Fundamental value of Jainism, I'm talking of this because organized by a Jain organization, is function. And the positive aspect of it is also helping animals survive. But these are a small community and their impact is limited. While the same principles would be a solid foundation for this movement is killing and vegetarianism, as I said, its role is limited. What is to be done? That's the crucial issue. The problem with Jainism, and I am addressing this to all my distinguished colleagues here is that we are focused on talking about the principles, one, or on penance. Top. The compassion part is not that well recognized or not well practiced. What we need is practical genius. And that's the crucial issue today. Our principle is so great, it's surprising. But there is hardly any gene, Jane, who is leading this movement against violence. There are Americans, there are English people, there are Australians. Where is the Jane leader? This is the real tragedy. And I think we'll have to come out of this shell. I'll give you one example. Well, I believe that all animals need to be protected or saved to the extent possible. Goshalas. Now, you know, today, I'm slightly involved in this work, and therefore I'm mentioning it, that male cows have no value in India, as in America. In a village, you would not find a single male cow. All of them are being Hindu, people leave them out, they throw them out of the farm, they start, or somebody picks them up and slaughters them. Millions of cows are just being, are just dying, slaughtered or starved. There are goshalas, sanctuaries for creatures. 
but their financial position is extremely difficult. And there's hardly any Gaushala which takes a new animal. Can we strengthen them? And I'm talking about practical aspects, financially. And there are technologies. Recently in India, we imported these technologies, such as tech semen. Only she cows are produced. Government, government really has accepted this now. And I hope the result of this introduction recently, about one million cows were saved. They were not produced at all and therefore in a way saved. There's a grass, super Napier grass. In one acre, this plant is 200 tons at least, 2 lakh kilos. And the cost of production is 50 paise, as against market rate of 4 rupees. But you will do these two things. The viability of Gaushalas would improve, and they would be in a position to take large number of pay or useless cattle, old cattle, will be saving lives. And on the other hand, the world is moving towards organic farming. Cow dung, one of the best manures. So it's high time that we think of, and as I said, I'm not only talking cows, other animals also there. But something practical has to be done. Is, I was talking to my friends in America and England who are engaged for great animal activists. I said, why don't you publicize your work? He said, no paper prints our work. You do. Know, five cases. Now, these companies are so powerful. It's, and they give advertisement to papers, big papers. Publish their news, they would lose the advertisements. That's what the solution. Solution is we find cases. And cases are filed, and the court gives an order, it gets publicized, and we get publicity for free. I, I was talking to somebody in India. He was a Brahmin, and I said, he was a, one of the greatest, one of the biggest. Uh, Slaughterhouse in India, Devnar in Mumbai. I said it was a Brahmin. I said, being a Brahmin, you are heading this organization. Animals are brought in. Healthy animals. The legs are broken. The cows can't be killed unless they are. They, 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 they can't. They, they are not sort of. They are in horrendous. He said, what can I do? What the rest? Whole thing is political in India. The moment you talk of vegetarian, I mean, the whole issue becomes political. How do you get over that? These are some of the aspects you have to consider. Other is high time we take a lot of your times. I'm told that even in America, almost 30, 40 percent of the universities, medical universities or colleges, don't teach subject to nutrition. Maybe one or two lectures, fine. Now, meat teaching is bad for health. Science recognizes this. They're not even teaching it. Now, can we at least, as a first step, try to persuade the governments to at least please declare this, that they are bad for health, as has been done in the case of tobacco. For cigarettes, there's always a, a sort of declaration. Same place, bad for health. Can we not do it? And also, can we make the system 
and change the practical parts. It is great. But unless it's converted into action, what's the use? Can we make it more transparent? I remember having reading the famous book or two of for Matthew Record. Made a very interesting point, of course, uh, not likely to be implemented. He said that all clotter houses are supposed to have walls of glass. I had a colleague of mine, meat eater, right from breakfast to zilla, everything meat. I asked him, I said, my friend, why don't you kill the animal yourself? You want me to stop eating? How many people eat killing? I don't know how to do it. The last point I have to make is use of social media, particularly among the young. Old people are difficult to change. Maybe some people got changed, but by and large, we should concentrate on the youth. And for example, I was honestly telling you, I was thinking of setting up an organization here, and my idea video which I saw must be circulated to at least 100,000 students. That would make an impact. So social media is such a powerful uh, sort of system now available. And unless we do something practical, in my mind, we are only talking, doing nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now I invite uh, Dr. Sugan Chenjain, President ISGS, for vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Pandey. And we are celebrating the 25, 2550th Nirvana year of Mahavir. And I think today's lecture reminded me of him sitting somewhere, his soul sitting somewhere, and we the people are transferring that knowledge of Ahinsa through various means. Philip, I'm thank you. Th I, Thank you a lot because what you bring is experiential explanation of Ahimsa. It's not theoretical, it's experiential and how you have seen, especially coming from a country like Australia, how the transformation has come to you and now you have made it like a mission, the main tool for sustenance of the civilization itself. So thank you very much. I think your message will help us, you know, transfer this idea or propagate this idea of Ahimsa globally. Then Dr. Mehta, I see you as the best practitioner of Ahimsa, especially its application of compassion. How you have been single-handedly looking at the, you know, disabled human beings and how you have been empowering them. This comes from the fundamental you know, belief in equality of all human beings. Philip talks of equality of all living beings and that is the ultimate. And Dr. Ferodia, you, you are creating a institution which will continue to propagate these values of Ahimsa and other aspects of Ahimsa for generations to come. So today I think it's a very good you know, celebration of this year and I thank all of you for participating in this thing. I also thank all the participants who have come to attend this lecture. I hope they find it you know, interesting and they carry parts of it in their future work and life to propagate the idea. I also thank my colleagues at ISJS who 
you know, took great pains to make this program successful. Thank you all very much.